Good evening, colleagues and visitors. My name's Rachel Baker. I am the Interim Pro Vice Chancellor for Research here at Glasgow Caledonian University, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to tonight's professorial lecture. Now, it's my job to say a few words about the, the lecture series, to welcome you, um, and to introduce Angela, and it's my privilege to do that tonight. So if you'll bear with me for, for five minutes, I won't, I won't cut into your time, I promise. The professorial lecture series reflects the public role that universities have. And for, for GCU, as the University for the Common Good, one of the uh, things that that relates to are the Sustainable Development Goals, which were set out by the United Nations in 2015, or the SDGs. And tonight we're focusing on SDGs number 5 and 16, if you didn't already know, which are concerned with gender equality and building strong institutions. <laughs> Professorial lectures are an opportunity for recently promoted professors to showcase their work, to share their research and their future plans with colleagues, with students, with research partners, with stakeholders, and importantly, with friends and family. And I'm delighted to see such a turnout here. Angela has with her tonight her husband Ian, daughter Beth, her sister Mary Rose, mother-in-law Jean and sister-in-law Jill, who I'm told has come all the way from the Shire, in this case it's Warwickshire I believe, <laughs> as well as a host of friends, colleagues and family and you are all most welcome. But allow me to introduce Angela. Angela was working in the Equal Opportunities Commission at the time of devolution when the idea of gender budgeting and forming the Scottish Women's Budget Group was first thought about. With Ailsa Mackay, Angela was amongst the founders of that group and it was Ailsa who suggested to Angela that she might like to do a PhD as it was, quote, a great way of combining early motherhood and research. <laughs> some friend. <laughs> Angela came to GCU and completed a PhD comparing developments in gender budgeting in Scotland, Andalusia and the Basque Country, making use of her Spanish language and developing an institutional diagnostic on gender budgeting implementation that's now used internationally. She's been at GCU since 2006 and a member of the Social Sciences Department since 2015. She's a key part of the WISE Centre for Economic Justice since its creation and is Deputy Director of that centre. Angela has also created and driven an MSc in Human Rights. But to now, tonight we celebrate the latest in her career achievements as Professor of Equality and Public Policy. Angela combines her academic work with activism and with advocacy. So as well as the curiosity, discovery and rigour that are characteristic of university research, Angela is committed to the impact that has on real social issues. And that commitment is particularly notable, I think, in your government advisory roles across a range of public policy issues, all focused on the advancement of equality. So, for example, Angela is chair of the Scottish Government's Equality and Human Rights Budget Advisory Group, long name, and was on the Commission on a Gender Equal Economy. In 2019, she was the recipient of the prestigious Joe Cox Award for Public Service and Active Citizenship. <coughs> As an academic, Angela supports a number of PhD students, including um, several in Spain and internationally. She co-authors uh, journal articles and special issues on gender budgeting and policy analysis and led the process of an edited volume on gender budgeting in Europe. I asked her what she liked to do outside of work and she said she enjoys wondering what she might do if she wasn't working. <laughs> but also, <laughs> she's a keen swimmer and she set herself a target of 5k in the pool for the Marie Curie Swimathon in April. But let's get to her lecture tonight. Angela is going to help us to navigate gender budgeting and feminist policy change and will tell us along the way about some of her personal career highlights. 
So please join me in welcoming to the floor Professor Angela O'Hagan. Wow, thank you very much, Rachel. Um, thank you all so, so much for coming. Um, it's really quite overwhelming, as you might imagine, standing in front of, well, firstly, your harshest critics. Um, there's lots of my family here. Um, <laughs> but so many people have made such an effort to come here, friends, family. Um, it's really, really quite overwhelming, quite nerve-wracking. Um, so b while I remember, I want to thank Rachel for that lovely introduction and thank Julie Duncan up the back, one of these people who behind the scenes make everything happen. So thank you very much to, to Julie. Um, so over the, the time we have together, and I will try to keep to time, which many of you will find an unusual career tra uh, character trait. Um, so... And what I'd like to talk to you about in the time that we have this afternoon, um, so there I am doing my bit for WISE, I think that was at D Dundee at an STUC Women's Conference, and is yes, to talk to you about um, activism and feminist, academic activism and feminist policy change. Because um, I think that characterises my professional work, my work as an academic, and has dominated my personal life <laughs> as well, as Ian and Beth will attest. And what I've done this afternoon is try to structure um, my lecture today around core themes and concepts in public policy. We deal with actors, ideas and institutions. And by that I mean I want to tell you about the people who have made me a professor and the people I work with, the idea of gender budgeting as feminist policy change, and the institutions I work with and the places I have worked. But first, a little bit of my backstory to today. We don't use that language here, Angela. Now, that's not my maybe famous um, expletives or the odd fluffy F. Um, but this was said to me by my secondary school headmistress, the indomitable sister, Hannon. So there's the first clue. Yes. <laughs> I was a convent girl. But it's also the first clue to some of the many privileges I've had in my life, um, that I was privileged to have, well, supposedly, that level of education, certainly that level of experience. But that was said to me when I led a delegation of one, <laughs> because everybody else had stepped back. And that's a lesson I have never learned and continue to find myself alone, a lone voice, volunteering, saying, oh, I'll do that. Um, but this time, it was to complain about the seemingly unkind and harsh treatment of some of the girls in the dormitory by the nun who was the dormitory mistress. And when I asserted that she had no right to treat us that way, <coughs> feeling very bold, a word that was used a lot about me, um, I was told, we don't use that sort of language here. And I'm mindful of that 40 years plus later, um, when I lead a highly successful Masters in Human Rights here at GCU, despite Sister Hannon and all her efforts and those of my parents, particularly my mum and dad, who thought, um, who tried very hard to dissuade me from, a, from politics and to do something useful. Um, so from secondary school to now a member of Senate here at GCU, I think I have demonstrated, excuse me, some independence of thought and spirit that some of you might be familiar with. I hope I have demonstrated leadership and enact the kind of leadership um, that I want to see in myself and with others, knowing when to take a lead, but listening, involving others, building consensus and understanding around a shared ambition, a shared project. <clears throat> I always think of Morag when I've written this, knowing what you can and can't do, because Morag would often tell me that there was lots of things that just wasn't physically possible because there were only 24 hours in the day. Um, but knowing what you can and can't do, knowing the difference and acknowledging the difference are not the same. So you still try to make 36 hours in a day. But through all of that, I hope it's also kept me a disruptor um, and for a, a, a good purpose, a good cause. But going back to, to Sister Hannon, I need to learn to say that with a bit more 
kindness. Or maybe I can say it with maturity of 40 years of reflection. But there were other life lessons in that episode too. And one of them, the first one, was power, about who wields power and in what form. And here in that situation, it was class and economic power and institutional power. The dormitory mistress was from rural Ireland and poorer than the well-educated, well-heeled uh, management nuns who could wear their country casuals post-Vatican II. That will resonate with some Scottish and Irish Catholics in the room. While this nun would a grey habit to denote her domestic service status as befitted someone who fed the pigs the scraps from the school dining hall. I only found that out later when, when I used to go with her to the pigs when I was in senior school, by which point I had begun to listen more to other people. Perspective, I think, was the second lesson. No wonder she was grumpy. Treated poorly by her own institution and having to, to suffer a gaggle of pretty entitled teenage girls would make anybody grumpy. But I learned much more about how to behave and how to treat people with respect from Sister Dwyer than I did from most of the other nuns and in many people in authority that I have met over my career. So to the first of my categories, in public policy terms, the critical actors, sometimes critical in that sense as well, rather than instrumental, which is of course the sense I mean when I describe the, pe the key people in my life and my progression to professor. Now, okay, um, tissue warning, okay, there's going, to be, there's going to be a few, okay, as we go through this. Okay, here we go. <clears throat> The people who made me, who made me and helped me stand here today are my family, my friends, my academic friends and mentors, the scholarly community, the academic collaborators and the babysitters. Um, let's never forget the babysitters, but I'll come back to all of these categories. And of course, they are all interchangeable. So I have to start with the powerful duo of Fiona Mackay and Ailsa Mackay, my academic mentors and friends. Fiona is here tonight, for which I am immensely grateful. It was a huge effort for Fiona to get here, and I really appreciate um, that huge effort. Thank you. Ailsa, as most of you will know, is not here tonight, and for that, is not here any longer. And for that, I remain profoundly sad every day. But together, they took on the task of wrangling me through a PhD, which Ailsa said, as, as, um, as Rachel has said, was a great way to combine motherhood and academic life. What a liar. <laughs> <coughs> and for context, I was pregnant with our son Elliot when I applied, and pregnant uh, with Beth when I started. <coughs> Throughout the process, Fiona demonstrated immense patience, but didn't stint with her frustrated guidance as well, eventually telling me to put the placards, the briefings, the pamphlets and the badgets in the drawer and get on with that PhD. <laughs> yes, Fiona. But I am forever grateful and indebted to them both, their generosity with their knowledge and time, their patience, their belief in me when I had none, and their good humour, and above all, their friendship. Thank you. Okay, this is really tough, okay? Folk in the front rows. <laughs> okay, because we don't do things alone. We don't do things by ourselves. And at least the most fortunate of us, do, fortunate of us don't. And I am one of the most fortunate women to have the fabulous family I have and the family I have created with Ian and Beth, along with the very best, best of pals. My lovely mum in the top here, beautiful Roma, and we have another beautiful Roma in the audience. <laughs> <clears throat> my lovely mum, my watchful Uncle Frank over on the other side, my sister Mary Rose, our lovely Momo, my niece, um, and my sister-in-law Jill. All have been huge 
huge influences in forming the shape of my life. Ian has been unstinting and undiminished in his belief in me all the way through the MSCs, the PhD, the ongoing imposter syndrome, the, <laughs> the pretty regular rants of frustration when progress is slow. Thank you. Ian and Beth are, of course, the loves of my life. And you're both my favorites. <clears throat> my fabulous, feisty, some feminist, all wonderful friends. From Muriel, Wendy, Anne, who are my extremely good friends. And we have a little WhatsApp group called In Extremis, which um, we can tell you about later, or you can just work it out. <laughs> um, Pauline and Lorraine, who've been with me since my undergrad days along with Suzanne, Patricia, Jackie, Yvette and Yvonne, who are not here. Um, <clears throat> Kate, where's Kate? Kate, wholly reliable, always unpredictable, um, but always, always there. Andy and Anne aren't with us tonight, but they have always had my back. Maura Gillespie, who used to be a colleague here at Glasgow Caledonian, um, was a source of great counsel for, for a long time. And the fabulous Sandra Spence in the bottom here, who very sadly is no longer with us. And Sandra believed in me more than I have ever believed in myself. <clears throat> so I'm very grateful to all of you. I told you I was going to make you great. <laughs> so moving on to my academic friends and mentors. <clears throat> Don't you start. Academic friends and mentors who have helped me navigate the vagaries of academic life, intellectually, bureaucratically, critically, with goodwill, good humour and a lot of fun along the way. Rachel Russell, my head of department since 2015, who brought me into the social sciences department and, and mentored me. Morag, Gillespie, eh, Morag Alexander, I'm sorry, Morag, um, who performed the ultimate act of friendship and read the early drafts of my PhD. <laughs> Honestly, you would never wish that on anybody, really. <laughs> Alison Lockhart, who's not with us tonight. Alison um, had to be elsewhere, without whom very little in this organisation would happen. Okay. Alison has been uh, just a, a tower of strength and, and just immense, immensely good colleague and friend. As has Sarah Cantillon, the director of WISE, um, for some time now, and is a joy to work with and to have as a colleague. Look at that lovely smiley face. Ema Jackson is up the back. Ema, always a source of quiet question and good counsel. Um, Fiona Skillen, the best roommate I could ever have asked for. <laughs> Fiona and Elsa again, and colleagues in Spain. Gloria Alarcón from Murcia, who, now there's a feminist academic activist. And Paloma de Villota, professor in the Complutense University of Madrid, who gave me the run of her office, the library, when I was starting out on my PhD fieldwork. So immensely generous colleagues, always. There's more, <laughs> okay. So the academic um, community of which I am part. Um, being introduced to and now a small part of an international community of scholars has been life changing. So many of these women I have looked up to, but I can now call my friends. Professor Diane Elson, Professor Antonella Picchio, huge names in our field, um, and who have given me their time, their good counsel, their wisdom. I've had conversations with some of the greatest scholars in our field, facilitated by Elsa, of course. Here she's pictured with Marlon Waring and Martha Feynman. My students will know, very much, will know a lot about Martha Feynman as well. Also pictured here are Gulay Gunnuk Shaneshin from Turkey and Yolanda Huedo in Spain. Again, hugely instrumental um, load stars in my work. And a lot of them came together when we had a lot of fun at the International Association for Feminist Economics conference here in 2019. It was certainly one to remember. Okay, we're nearly there, but we can't move off without mentioning the babysitters. <laughs> Never forget or forget to be kind to the babysitters. Nana Jean in the front row, Auntie Brenda, Sylvia, photographed here 
in Palma de Mallorca when I was speaking at a conference and Sylvia, who lives in Barcelona, said, oh, I'll just pop over and I can babysit while you're in the conference. I'll just pop over from Barcelona to Palma. <laughs> and famously arrived just as I was winding up my, my presentation in the conference and so could hear me speaking and was, was very enthused by me speaking in Spanish and said to Beth, oh, what do you think of your mum? You listen to your mum speaking, mum's at work and she's speaking Spanish. To which Beth did a famous eye roll and just said, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> <laughs> Having heard it all before. <laughs> Rosa on the far side here from San Sebastian gave me their family home. Again, as a writing retreat in the base for my fieldwork in San Sebastian. Beth is pictured there as a wee talk because that was the room in which she took her first steps from the kitchen to the living room in a previous trip. And front and centre is Adele, front and centre here as well, um, always there for school runs and pickups, sleepovers and the occasional glass of wine, and who is now um, a lifelong friend. My academic collaborators include Elizabeth Klatzer, with whom I um, co-edited the first Budget, uh, the first volume on gender budgeting in Europe, Tindara Adabo from Modena, with whom I've twice um, co-authored special issues of the Journal of Economic Policy. And I'm very grateful to another colleague in Spain, Elena Perez at the University of Alicante, who invited me to, get, to, be a special, uh, to edit a special issue, thereby con combining my two passions for Spanish and, as my students know, the work of Carol Bakke. And finally, the students. It is an enormous privilege to stand in front of any classroom. Um, the students are a constant source of learning, notwithstanding the usual frustrations about requests for extensions. Um, but as I say, it's a privilege and is so lovely of so many of you to have come tonight, really. Thank you very much. So finally, the ideas. What am I on about? So, my ideas are generally drawn from the discipline of feminist economics. Um, it is a discipline. Feminist economics and feminist economists are real things, they're not one or the other. Um, and so, my core idea from feminist economics um, is about challenging, or rather, before, so feminist economics is about challenging the premise or that and revealing the premise that economic systems and processes are androcentric, are male-dominated, and that produce and reproduce unequal outcomes for women and men on the basis of established norms of social and economic life that form economic structures and influence policymaking, most often without regard for the centrality of unpaid care. So what I do within that is what we call gender budgeting. So it's not about separate budgets for women and men, or as a particularly annoying civil servant once said to me, oh, is it about pink budgets and blue budgets? Ha, ha, ha. <laughs> you can imagine how that went down. <laughs> but what gender budgeting does is challenge the assumption that budgets are gender neutral, that budgets don't have gendered characteristics, that budgets are financial um, activity, and that's not, that doesn't have a gender, and that's not about gendered. But budgets are about public money, and how public money is directed towards people. So they are absolutely, budgets are absolutely about people, and therefore are not gender neutral. They're absolutely about understanding the differences between how in women and men um, live their lives, and how um, women and men are empowered to and facilitated to live their lives. So through a gender budgeting process, through gender budget analysis, we examine how resources are allocated, looking at budgets, where public um, decision, decisions around public finance um, to allocate and spend resources are made, and to analyse the impact on women and men, because there will be a differential impact, because social structures, economic structures, affect women differently, produce different conditions in which women and men live. And so, how we spend money and how money is allocated will, will land, will effect differently um, for women and men. And so then the challenge is to redistribute resources in such a way that they can contribute to advancing gender equality. And that means encouraging policymakers and others to engage in gender impact assessment and gender analysis of policy processes and decisions in order to reveal 
different and unequal outcomes for women and men from spending decisions and to roll back from that and to make different decisions that will elim eliminate those differences and advance, advance gender equality. Always mindful um, of making care and unpaid work visible in our economic policy and government responses. I really like this quote. I use it a lot in my teaching and in talking to all sorts of people about, about gender budgeting. It doesn't come from feminist economics literature. It comes instead from the public policy canon and two huge names in that canon, Hugh Hecklow and Aaron Voldavsky. In this fantastic piece of work they did in the Treasury in the late 70s, published in 1981 as The Private Government of Public Money. And in this book, it's fabulous. They talk about the strong men of the Treasury and the good men of the Treasury and the corridors of power in the Treasury. It's like listening to Colonel Pickering and Professor Higgins as they discuss Eliza after her triumph at the ball. No wonder she threw her slippers at them. But <clears throat> because what they are talking about and, and so cleaved to is the justification for that description of the Treasury as being about powerful men because that's who dominate and who inhabit powerful institutions, or until more recently. But the reason I really like this quote is because it challenges the finance departments, the officials, and all the others who say, yes, but gender's nothing to do with budgeting. Gender's nothing to do with public finance. Well, if you won't take it from me, you might take it from, from Heckelow and Vildavsky, because it brings that whole idea of public finance right front and centre into our daily lives. Because surely nothing this little the state does is more important than using so much of the nation's work and wealth and few other governmental activities so consistently affect the lives of everyday citizens, whether it's transport, health, education, um, potholes, everybody's favourite complaint, bus shelters, etc. They're all part of the budget process and need to be made visible and need to be brought forward in procuring um, and or rather securing the, the allocation of public um, resource and in how we raise public resource. And so I think of gender budgeting as feminist policy change because it aims to improve women's rights and economic situation. It aims to reduce the gender-based hierarchies that are built into our policy and decision making, whether that's the causes and consequences of the equal pay, uh, sorry, the gender pay gap and the lack of equal pay. Um, the decisions that, that every day produce and reproduce gendered inequalities. And gender budgeting aims to Im examine the impacts of public finance decisions at both the household and in the public sphere. So looking at, at social security, looking at taxation um, and the effects that that has at the household level on the distribution of resources, um, which of course is, is one of Sarah's specialisms. It focuses on women and men and can be identified with recognised feminist movements. So that's the kind of theorising of, of gender budgeting as feminist policy change. The, the recognised feminist movements is where Fiona Forsyth in the audience here comes in. Because it was Fiona who had been engaged in international women, transnational activism. And in 1995 said, I've been hearing about this thing called gender budgeting. Do you think? Well, in 1995, coming out of the, the fourth conference on women in Beijing and the platform for action. So by about 1998, 99, Fiona was saying, I've been hearing this thing about gender budgeting. We're on the cusp of the new politics in Scotland, the, the new parliament, the new government. Fiona was saying, do you think we could maybe do that in Scotland? Well, well we could give it a go, you know. <laughs> um, and said, so, but I think we need, we need an economist. I think there's a feminist economist, Ailsa somebody at GCU. And so the Scottish Women's Budget Group was, was born. And the Scottish Women's Budget Group, I'm very pleased to see, are here in force tonight. Thank you very much. But that means we've gone from strength to strength over those many years, and that, that is really encouraging. So the, active, and the academic activism that Rachel introduced. Now, the whole point, not the whole point, but inevitably tonight is a bit showy-offy, isn't it? Um, but it's not, it's not meant to be. By listing just some of the things that I'm involved with or have been involved in to try and show that relationship between civil society, between academia and between policy influence. This is why I'm never home. And 
<laughs> and you have to have microwave dinners. So a member of these various governmental groups over the years are currently involved in different ways in the women's budget movement because it is a social movement. And one of the really significant changes over the 20 years is that we have been building a social movement for change. It was just a few of us in 1999. We now have you know, organisations that are having an impact, making, an influence, making a, a difference, and are joining with other voices in human rights budgeting and wider equality budgeting. And so it's been through working in partnership with colleagues in all of these areas and trying to build the academic research behind it um, that underpins some of it that I've been, that's been the space, they have been the spaces which I have occupied in these last 20 years. <clears throat> it's a bit like the L'Oreal adverts, you know, and now for the science bit, you know. <laughs> Here's the theory. So building on public policy established ideas of iron triangles in the feminist policy literature, particularly Alison Woodward talks about the velvet triangles. Diane Nelson talks about these in terms of gender budgeting and economic policy development. And that relationship between feminist academics, so that rigorous research that Rachel talked about, relationship with feminist civil society organisations reaching much further than academic research will reach, engaging in people in the lived realities of their everyday lives, and bringing those two together to try and inform and shape government policy. And I'm really pleased and grateful to see colleagues here from government uh, tonight. So, a bit more theory on the feminist side. Traditions of feminism, liberal feminism, um, radical feminism, liberal feminism maybe more concerned with her taking approach around reforming, radical feminism more about dismantling. I think I know which camp I'm in. But can they be both? And I think in the job I do, they have to be both. It's that managing being a foot in both camps of the insider-outsider status, trying to understand government and the way government works, trying to build the capacity and confidence in there while at the same time dismantling and encouraging that dismantling of those structures that continue to produce and reproduce the inequalities that we're trying to challenge. So I think it can be both and sometimes strategically, practically has to be both. <clears throat> Why ever got a picture of Mr. Ben? <laughs> For those of you who don't know, Mr. Ben was a cartoon character back in the very olden times. Um, and that, so I watched Mr. Ben a lot when I was wee, and I liked Mr. Ben. And he speaks to the imposter syndrome, he speaks to the disguising oneself in these different roles. When, um, with Morag's guidance, working with Muriel Robison, we were newbies at the Equal Opportunities Commission, devolution was just happening, we had to scale up our policy um, activity, there were new institutions to growing and being shaped and we were trying to shape and influence them. So very quickly, and not by accident, I found myself having conversations with sometimes quite senior civil servants and being in policy spaces that I had never been before. And so I did two things. I self-funded a master's in public policy and I bought a very nice uh, Liz Claiborne, I think it was, Lorraine. Um, on the sale, obviously. Um, pinstripe suit because <laughs> I felt better when I was in that environment because I looked like them or I looked like how I thought they looked and by looking a bit more like them that confused some of the people I was speaking to as well because I looked a bit like them but I wasn't speaking like them I wasn't saying the same things as them so that's why Mr Ben is there but that having to learn from others, learning how to locate yourself in other spaces um, and to keep the conversation going and to turn that conversation into change. I'm still there and I'm still talking. <clears throat> but it was also to combat some of this. <laughs> I've had this cartoon since my days at the Equal Opportunities Commission and that wasn't yesterday. And Ailsa had it on her wall and various colleagues have all had it down the years. Um, and it says, five men round the table, one woman. And it says, that's an excellent suggestion, Miss Triggs. Perhaps one of the men here would like to make it. How many times have many of us been in those situations in, in a room where that has been said in various forms? 
And so, being that lone voice at times, it was maybe sometimes easier to be, you know, to look like I belonged there, because what I was saying didn't belong there. And it's also a reminder to us, we were having this conversation yesterday about being an ally, about speaking up, about not speaking over people, but giving people their place and giving women their voice and not speaking over, um, over what they have to say and coming in behind them, coming in after them to reinforce that point. So, academic activism. I am inspired here by leadership of scholars such as Sarah Ahmed, Kathleen Lynch, oh, I wish, um, but hugely energised by Kathleen Lynch, Fiona Mackay, Akugo Emidjulu, and Catherine Ashley and Beecham Marguasha, who I quote here. And in their description of academic activism, they talk about a politicised or critical scholarship, research that aims to empower a marginalised and oppressed constituency by making them visible and audible and that attempts to challenge prevailing hierarchies, hierarchies. So pretty much what I've been talking about so far, including in terms of the construction of knowledge. But is, act, is activism appropriate for academics? Some think not, but yet at the same time, we are increasingly required to demonstrate our impact. What difference have we made? Well, if you're a social scientist, the clues, you know, the, it's on the, whatever the phrase is, the clues on the tin, you know, social change. But that's not always well understood and certainly not in some of the metrics that we use. So thinking about knowledge as power and knowledge as empowering. Thinking about transformation at the core of the feminist project. So that combines for me in taking research informed and theoretically shaped knowledge out of the academy and into women's groups, tenants associations, food pantries, trade unions, as well as into the Scottish Parliament and Scottish Government, building gendered knowledge and gendered capacity. Because if knowledge is power, why should that power reside in academic institutions? Where else should it reside? Whose knowledge is it? What is the power of that knowledge and what is the purpose of that knowledge? Well, I think the purpose is transformation of people's lives, of political institutions and of policy-making processes and outcomes. And it's because of that approach of knowledge as empowerment that I was awarded, as, as Rachel said, the Joe Cox Award for Public Service and Active Citizenship, nominated again, been recognised and supported all the way, the hand of Fiona Mackay, um, nominating me for this award from the PSA. It was a huge deal for me personally, it was great for us as a department and institution, but it was huge to be recognised for that type of academic activism, that type of academic work. And all the more poignant having, or because of the, the awful manner of Joe's death, but having known Joe and worked with Joe, albeit very briefly, in our time together at Oxfam. So my students here will know exactly what I'm talking about. We said it this morning. We talk about knowledge in the policy process, going back to the founding principles, founding ideas of policy, and policy studies as um, promoted and studied by Harold Laswell. And William Dunn, in talking about that knowledge and talking about Laswell's approach, talks about the creation of knowledge is about the process of policy making and that the knowledge so created, so knowledge created in that process should be used to improve that process. And so why when we talk about public policy and public policy analysis, at least in my class, we talk about what do we know? I want a chorus here from the students. <laughs> what do we know? About whom? Where does that knowledge come from? And how is that knowledge used? Because if it's back to the table where the five white men and the one woman are sitting around that table, then that type of knowledge is not going to bring about the kind of transformation that makes a difference in people's lives. So what do we know about people? Where does that knowledge come from? Does it come from um, the lived experiences, the lived realities of people's lives beyond elite policy and, and political institutions. How good is our data? How do we use that data? Do we have data that helps us understand the intersections of people's lives and people's experiences in terms of their marginalised status because of their racialised experience? They're that much further away <clears throat> because of the gendered differences that are 
part of how we form and shape and structure societies. So we need to see and understand from the data that we use those intersections and to better understand it and better understand how we apply it. And so the knowledge has to come from more than, than white men and it has to be used in ways that start to question how resources are allocated, by whom, for what purpose, and to, to redistribute and reorientate. And so feminist policy change through gender budgeting is about all of that. It's about improving the data that we have, how we apply that data, bringing it into analysis of how public resources are generated and allocated, bringing the budget, the budget process in, not as a separate exercise of a kind of technocratic approach that remains the, do the domain of finance, but seeing the budget as part of the policy process, completing in some ways the policy process, or at least another stage in the cycle of the policy process. Ultimately, it's about following the money to track the allocation and spend and outcome, and to make better decisions in relation to people's lives and achieve better outcomes and public services. You're still with me? <laughs> That's Mo and I off to the big do to receive my Joe jo Cox Award. So finally, on to institutions. Where have I worked? Where have I been trying to, to ply this trade all these years? Most often the Scottish Parliament, sometimes the dizzying heights of Belfast for the Chartered Institute of Public Finance Accounting, quite often much further afield. I'm very lucky I've been able to travel to lots of different places, including um, a wee cheeky selfie in Oxford, just pretending that I was there for um, more than half a day um, on a <laughs> to give a paper. But one of the main places, one of the main institutions I have been located and working all these years is in the Scottish budget process. Um, and within that, it was instrumental in bringing into being the economic, uh, sorry, the Equality and Fairer Scotland budget statement in 2009, which is, and it should be, Nula, isn't it? It's a work in progress, but we're getting there in terms of an analysis of how money is raised and spent um, through the Scottish budget. Scotland is the only jurisdiction within the UK to have this. Um, and it is a work in progress. There's been a lot of changes and iterations as the institution has become more responsive as well. We have the Equality and now the Equality and Human Rights Advisory Group, ridiculously long name. Um, but again, we can see how that has changed over time, that we've now expanded into to equality and human rights with Joe Ferry um, from Glasgow, Ali Hosey from the Scottish Human Rights Commission, and Lucy Mulvey from the Alliance with whom we are working away trying to, to increase um, and reshape the process to, to take on board and to take a human rights based approach. I was involved in the budget review process, a joint piece of work between the Scottish Parliament and the Scottish Government in 2016 about trying to, to refit the Scottish budget process as the Scottish budget changed and became much more of a, a revenue raising rather than expenditure budget. So after all this effort, do we have gender budgeting in Scotland? Well, no. <laughs> so maybe I'm not very good at it. <laughs> there is always that. Um, but could we have gender budgeting in Scotland? Absolutely. Absolutely we can have. Partly because we now have this social movement. We have built this knowledge. We have built this um, community of practice and community of learning inside and outside the academy. So what do we need to make it happen? We need institutional responsiveness. The top point there is based on the diagnostic that was part of my PhD. What are the favourable conditions that help gender budgeting land as an idea? How do we um, adopt, adapt and implement the idea? You need the political will. You need people to know what you're talking about. Um, you need to build that capacity. You need to be able to maximise political opportunities when they arise. But in common with many other ideas, it's vulnerable to political change the electoral cycle, we've just been through that with the, the first minister elections in Scotland and seen how ideas have been pitted off one another. So all ideas are vulnerable, not just to the electoral cycle, but to other um, machinations of the political process. But we also need to build institutional capacity and to have institutional capacity to deliver that change. We need to understand the institutional resistances. Are they ideological? Are they lack of knowledge? Are they time? Officials and government are hugely pressured. 
But we also have to secure and maintain and to keep saying that gender equality is a legitimate political goal and is not just for Christmas, just for the good times when economically we're in a better place. So wild-eyed and scary, <laughs> am I optimistic or delusional as we go forward? Some people would remember that night. <laughs> so I'm travelling hopefully. We're doing a lot of work, as I say, on human rights budgeting, bringing the human rights frameworks into the idea of maximising available resources for the progressive realisation of rights. Is that not right, students? How many times have you heard that? I want that in a t-shirt, <laughs> just to let you know. We have the Human Rights Bill coming forward in Scotland. Hopefully a time of aspiration. We have ongoing diverse and active feminist activism in Scotland. Here at GCU, we have the Wise Centre for Economic Justice, growing in strength, growing in impact, growing in numbers and reach with our partners locally and globally. Same with the Scottish Women's Budget Group, UK Women's Budget Group, they strength in numbers now across the devolved governments and international networks. But I'm also travelling warily. The commodification of education, making education and the cost of education further from the reach of many people is a problem and is a problem for our sector. The dilution of academic research time, increased workloads are not sustainable. So the potential for impactful research is undermined. The relationships are undermined. I was part of the last um, process that we go through when our work is scrutinised by our peers. I was fortunate enough to present a research um, an impact case study in the research excellence framework. But will I achieve another in the current context? Will we as a sector and governmentally reform our system of education and of research funding so we have better metrics and more importantly better values that support international student learning for example rather than engage in further colonisation of impoverished individuals and indebted governments to fund public education in this country? So we're navigating all of this at a time of huge political volatility at a local level, certainly at the international level, changes in political processes and in the direction. So some challenges. So where next? <laughs> so keep going on gender and human rights budgeting. We are inching forward. There's good people there working on all sides on this. Understanding the institutional resistances is an area of particular research interest to me. I also want to re-engage in empowering women's participation in economic policy making. Might even suggest the new principal or our vice principal for research. <laughs> Gender budget analysis of research funds at GCU. Maybe I could try a rest. That might be quite a good idea. Or maybe we could all just go to the bar. <laughs> but wherever I'm going, I'm going with these beautiful people these wonderful people um, who are my life. So thank you all very much for coming tonight and for listening. Thank you very much. towards our time and I want to before I'm going to invite you all to join us uh, to continue this conversation over a glass of wine and perhaps even some canapes um, I just, I, and before I say a few words I want to see if Beth and Roma might be here because I feel they might want to just come to the front please Now, if there weren't dry eyes in the introductory <laughs> slides. <laughs> thank you, Beth and Roma, and thank you, Angela, for a fantastic inaugural professorial lecture that I think. Um, really demonstrated, um, I suppose, success across a number of spaces, and it's very, very difficult to do that as an academic. It's difficult to 
to be good at teaching, to be good at publishing, but then also to be good at impact, to be good at policy engagement, to be good at activism and advocacy. And this was an incredible insight, a window into a journey uh, where, you've, where you've done so much in so many spaces. So congratulations on that, Angela, and huge appreciation. It's very, very impressive. Um, Thank you. Thank you all for coming. Uh, what a great crowd we've had here tonight. Thank you, and friends, family, colleagues, students, all of you um, for joining us here tonight. Um, we have got some drinks in Canapes, have we not? So, what, what, I'm just going to direct you because I don't want you to get lost on the way to the wine. Um, coming out of here, it's a left turn and then it's a first right to the back of the George Moore restaurant. So I invite you to join us all here and just to say one more big congratulations to Professor Angela O'Hagan.